Fulton. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Nostalgia Podcast. My name is Matt Fulton. I am the host and creator of Nostalgia.com and I'm a big geek towards Australian music, TV, film and anything that's a bit retrospective and nostalgic. I get it. Nostalgic for Australian pop culture. In this edition, I catch up with someone who has been in the radio and TV industry for many a year and now he's based overseas. But if you recognise this thing... And being one of the lucky kids who have appeared on these game shows... This is Wipeout, and now please welcome the man with all the right answers. All signs point towards Tony Johnston, one of the most talented people in the Australian TV and radio industry. Now, he's got an extensive CV, but where he is right now is somewhere overseas. He hasn't run off from Australia. He loves Australia. He reads so much about it all, so he still keeps in contact with many people. But without any ado... And any spoiler alerts, I guess. (laughs) I caught up with Tony over a Skype session with a massive time difference, and we spoke nerdy TV stuff. And what a top bloke he is. Tony, how are you going? I'm very well, Matt. I'm I'm sitting here looking out at the Swiss Alps at the moment because that's where I'm I'm living, and uh, it's coming into the springtime. We've got a beautiful blue sky day out there, and it's it's a warm day for here, which at the moment's about nine degrees. <laughs> Back home, I'd be freezing, but uh, but here that's kind of you know that's that's getting into warm territory. So uh, sitting here enjoying the vista, and and you know really appreciate the opportunity to catch up for a chat. Thank you so much. We're, this is a long overdue chat, and. Uh, finally we get to talk but you're in Switzerland at the moment what are you doing over there? Do you know I've, I've been here now for about 10 years coming and going and in 2007 I just I was at that stage in my life where I was looking for something a little bit different and and to expand my horizons and I'd been traveling a lot prior to that with the great outdoors on channel 7 and I think that travel bug was was still in my blood it was still in my system and I just sort of reached out for opportunities abroad and you know people might often go to to the UK or they might often go to the US or Canada and for some reason Switzerland and I'm not sure why but Switzerland popped up and there was a job here working for the equivalent of the ABC or the BBC, the Swiss National Broadcaster, the SSR, SRG, and uh, they have an English service and they were looking for people from around the world to come and work for them at their radio station. So I was the token Aussie, if you like, and I started working with them back in 2007 and, and I've been here ever since. I do get back home regularly and that's really important to me for family and friends and I love to stay connected with home and, and my Australian roots and and the Australian culture. So I'm I'm fortunate to get back two or three times a year, but Switzerland is now my second home. And it wasn't easy at first. It took a while to to settle in for a whole range of reasons and a big part of that being the cultural differences. But now it really does feel like my my second second home. Never, won't ever be completely home, but Australia is always in my heart. Well, every time I hear Switzerland, I always think the fancy chocolate or <laughs> just a beautiful scenery what's outside your window right now ah uh, let me let me paint a picture for you there's Heidi, she's just sort of, you know, she's dancing along through those green pastures. There's a fella up there playing the Alphorn. I can see a few <laughs> cows with bell. No, actually, I've got traffic in front of me. Do you know, I mean, it's like a lot of places, isn't it? You know, it's getting busier here. Yes, it is idyllic. And there are all of those cliched images that we have about Switzerland. And it certainly lives up to, to what that it might be in your imagination. But, uh, you know, it's like a lot of places. It's growing. It's got the pressures of uh, traffic and and uh, development and population growth and, and all of that. But what's what's nice here, and when I first moved here, a, a gentleman, a bloke who'd been living here for 40 years, a, a Brit, he said to me, you only have to go 10 or 15 minutes in any direction and you can be in nature. And it is very true here. You know, I can walk from, from where we live 10, 10 minutes up the back and, and you're in the forest. 10 minutes in front, I'm looking out over Lake Geneva at the moment and uh, behind Lake Geneva are the, 
the Swiss Alps. So you don't have to go too far. And, and the Swiss have a very strong work ethic. They, they work hard. But equally, when they have that downtime, that time off, they also like to relax and get back into nature and back into the mountains. And I kind of like that that balance here. Uh, it's certainly certainly one of the things I enjoy on, on the weekends, apart from talking to you at the moment, Matt. <laughs> it's okay. I feel so special now. Uh, <laughs> you're well-travelled, so with um, we're going to step back a little bit into yeah. how you actually got to Switzerland. But as you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, uh, the great outdoors – uh, before we go even further back, tell me how, um, what was it like to work on a travel show? Um, did you get to choose certain areas where you wanted to go or um, was there anyone like listed go, oh, oh, I've got to go to Russia or anything like that. <laughs> I, I, I wish. It was, it was always Ernie, Ernie Dingo got the best trips. No, no, I, I, I jest. Uh, <laughs> you know, that was, I mean, that was an amazing time. After five years, I was sick of living out of a suitcase. And so how, how it worked was, so this is a period between about 1997 and 2002, 2003, thereabouts. So I'd been working on, on the kids shows and the kids quiz shows and Wonderworld and all that sort of stuff. And, and then the opportunity came up to be involved with the great outdoors. And at first it was a, it was a dream come true. And I think for me, from a professional perspective, I'd, I'd always been Matt studio based and mostly, and then all of a sudden there was this opportunity to be on the road and not just on the road, but actually, you know, traveling, traveling the world. And how it worked was that we would be away for say two or three weeks for a, for a particular trip and we'd go to a particular location. And funnily enough, Switzerland was, was one of those places. And, and I think, you know, that's where I developed that interest and, and perhaps that love for Switzerland. So we'd be away for two or three weeks. Within that time, we would do uh, five or so stories. We were working pretty solidly, pretty, pretty hard. So we'd be working almost every day. We'd have a, a day off in between to actually relax and enjoy where we were. You know, it wasn't always just sort of sitting around pools even and, and reading books and drinking cocktails, which it might've looked like on the show. We'd, you know, we'd shoot that shot for five or 10 minutes. Trust me, Matt, I, I, I am telling the truth here. <laughs> so you'll be- It wasn't, with it your, wasn't one giant holiday. Yeah, with your daiquiri, you'll be like, oh, it's empty. <laughs> uh, another take, I don't think you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know what we used to do? Cause I, I made some really good friends from that time, the producers and the crews and whatever, and we're still in touch, which is, which is awesome. And we'd often save those shots for when we were having the daiquiri with the little umbrella sticking out of the top and the token <laughs> piece of pineapple. Yeah. Uh, we'd often save those shots uh, to the end of the day when we'd finished working. And so we'd get that shot and then everyone would down tools, turn the camera off, if only you saw what was going on off camera <laughs> after that. Um, gosh, it'd go viral these days. We were so lucky we didn't have social media back then. Yeah. Uh, what happens on the road stays on the road. And I think I was happy to, to have been working at that time when we didn't have those sort of pressures. But we would we would then sit around and, and socialise and hang out and, and catch up as as mates and that was you know that was one of the endearing qualities from that time. So yeah, I was with them for for five years, saw some amazing places. You could put in requests, so you could say you know I'd like to go to Russia or I'd like to go here or or there. Um, you know, often they would they would work it out and they'd balance it out between the presenters. So they'd say, okay, Tony was in Europe last time. We'll send him to America or New Zealand this time. Bridget, she was in South Africa. So we'll send her somewhere. So it balanced out. So it didn't always look like, you know, Ernie was here or Tony was here or Bridget was, was there or whatever the case may be. But uh, yeah, got to, got to see a lot. I filled two passports uh, during that time. And, and actually, Matt, what's interesting from that, uh, when I finished on the great outdoors and started working in, in radio when I would then travel personally or, or, you know, by myself or with my family, you'd get to the customs at a particular country and they'd look in your passport full of stamps and all these exotic places and they're thinking, gosh, this guy's either a diplomat or a drug dealer (laughs) (laughs) because your passport was full of all of these, you know, interesting exotic locations and they're saying, hmm, what does this guy actually actually do? But uh, yeah, great, great memories of of that time. Cool. Well, you looks like you've traveled the world the wonders of the world and really really bad segue <laughs> to one of your first jobs would it be on tv wonder world yeah actually go goes back a little bit before that uh first First job was actually delivering. So I grew up in Sydney, moved to Brisbane with the the family when I was a teenager. Got the got the part time job delivering pamphlets in the the local Quest community newspaper. Oh, good old and- Quest. 
That's it. Uh, and, and then actually I got a job at Macca's. I worked at Macca's for, uh, for 12 months at, at Indrapilly. And, you know, I still look back on that time. I learned a, a lot there from a part-time job perspective, quality service and cleanliness and, you know, how to earn. Indrapilly Shopping Centre? That's it. Yeah, That's I've it. eaten there. So, uh, well, now I can go back there next time and go, ah, Tony Johnston was here. Tony, wor- <laughs> Tony worked here. Uh, you know, and, I, and actually a good mate of mine from that time, he, he stayed with the, the fast food chain and uh, he's now got five stores and sometimes I, I look at where I am and, uh, you, know, you, know, <laughs> you know, how media can be, you know, oh, to, yeah. in terms of scratching out an existence sometimes, eking out a living. Yeah. And he's got five stores and I think maybe I should have stayed with that. That perhaps, but uh, yeah, you yeah, always so, reflect on that and you go, hmm, I'm in the wrong industry now. Hold on, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I, I love what I do and I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, so I, I started, I was doing some amateur theatre. My next door neighbour was a drama teacher and she said, Oh, look, we've got all these girls, you know, as a teenager doing drama and we need some boys in the, in the little local plays. And I thought, Oh. Oh, there you go. There's a chance to meet some girls. I'll go and I'll go and take part in the drama class, which I did. And then one day she came and said, "Oh, look, they're doing an audition for a for a TV show. I was 15, going on 16. Would you like to audition?" I thought, "Oh, yeah, why, why not?" So I went along to this audition. I was so nervous, Matt. I, like I can still, I still shudder at thinking about it and that thought of going to this audition and there were a hundred people there and it was a music video show, 1985 called Saturday Jukebox on Channel 7 in Brisbane. So, you know, people elsewhere in Australia wouldn't, wouldn't have heard about it, but it was, you know, one of those classic 80s sort of uh, music video shows. MTV had just started and you had Seven Rock and you had all these uh, sounds with Donny Sutherland and you had all these shows and, and Saturday Jukebox was the Queensland equivalent of that. And what they wanted, Jamie Dunn, who did Agro, was the producer of that. And what they wanted was a teenager presenting for teenagers. So here I was with my t- part-time job at Macca's, going to school during the week and doing this audition. 100 people, they got it down to 50, they got it down to 25, down to 10. And I was just like, oh, please get this process over. I couldn't handle it any longer. You know, just the drawn out anticipation of whether you got the job or not. And I got it. I, To this day, I... Gosh, I mean, it was luck. It was, you know, it was a lot of things. And I'm so thankful for that opportunity because it gave me, you know, gave me that foot in the door that anyone seeking to break into the entertainment industry looks for. And now you've got all these reality shows and talent shows and there's other ways. But back then we didn't have any of that. And that was my big break, if you like, my foot in the door. So I did that for a couple of years. And then Channel 9 approached me to work for them doing a kids show called OK, Only for Kids. That was also just in Queensland with Laurel Edwards. Now you'd know Laurel from from Radio in Brisbane and her husband, Troy Casadaly, the country music artist. Laurel and I worked together for quite a number of years and we're, we were just in, in touch on Facebook last night where she's like a sister. I, I love Laurel and that was a, it was, Matt, it was a wonderful time um, because we were, we were kids basically and we didn't really know what we were doing and it was like an apprenticeship in a sense. We had to do the mail and that's when people used to send, remember mail? Snail mail? <laughs> yes, that's the thing that <laughs> Australian <laughs> Post exists for, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, we'd send out the prizes. We'd go and do shopping centre shows on the school holidays. We was we would make we would make the props for the set. Wow. Uh, we'd we'd go to the supermarket to buy the ingredients for the cooking segment. I mean, we we literally did, and that was a wonder. And it still serves me today. Those skills that we learnt from back then, it was almost like an apprenticeship uh, for for a career in media. And so, yeah, then it sort of progressed. Channel 9 went from OK to Wonderworld, the remake of Simon Townsend's Wonderworld in the early 90s. And and here we are, mate. <laughs> wow. Here we are, st- still uh, still surviving. Yes. Well, with Wonderworld, do you mind if we talk about that for a second? Not at all. The processes for Wonderworld when you were on it, uh, because you shed the spotlight with Good Trina Roundtree, uh, yes. Pascal Fox, Sean Penn. No, not Sean Penn. What's his name? Nick Penn. 
Whoops. Next, yeah. yeah, don't worry, yeah I, that's I, right. I, he, won't, he won't mind being yeah. <laughs> compared with Sean Penn, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and Jody Young. And uh, yeah. I think that's everyone from your – Was it you, you were only on there for the first season, weren't you? Yeah, I was, I, I was there for a couple of years. I, I, gosh, I don't even remember now how many episodes that was. But, yeah, it was a few, it was a few series, a few yeah. seasons. Uh, and there were one or two other people that sort of came and went. Uh, that, that, that seems to be the nature of media sometimes. But, yeah, some, you know, some of these names who've also gone on to successful, like Katrina in her own right, Katrina Roundtree has gone on to a very successful career in media. Nick Penn, still involved <laughs> in, yeah. in com. <laughs> I <laughs> love him. You know, he was just hilarious. <laughs> It was hilarious. He was funnier in the office than what he was on the TV, yeah. and he was funny on the TV. So I loved working with Nick. Yeah, he's still he's living in northern New South Wales these days, and I was also living there before I, I moved to Switzerland, so we stayed in touch. I'm, you know, loosely connected with Katrina on, on social media and with Jody on social media and Pascal, and it was only recently that I was thinking and, and someone sort of suggested that we have a bit of a reunion or a bit of a catch-up or even a bit of a, I don't know, some sort of... Uh, you know, forum reflection chat show where we sit around and talk about the good old days and maybe play some of the old stories and some of the old uh, some of the old tapes. But it was it was uh, it was a, a fun time. That was a, a truly fun time because we, as well as working together, we we often socialised together. So we'd finish work. We were at Crow's Nest. Our office was in Crow's Nest in Sydney, and then we'd go out. Thursday was payday. You used to get a little envelope with with cash, a little bit of cash in your envelope that was payday and we'd take off around the traps in North Sydney and and over in the CBD area and we'd we'd go out so we used to socialize uh together as well sometimes we'd come in the next morning a little bit worse for wear and a little bit shabby a little bit hungover (laughs) and here we were doing a kid's show you know looking like we're all you know role models and mentors for the for the young Australians of the future but uh yeah fun fun times once again cool and you also did uh the next lot of shows that you had done with the game shows for kids uh, Time Masters and Wipeout My Generation were you consulted or did you apply for those gigs or um, h- how did you fall into those hosting roles? Yeah, great question, Matt. And, and when I was working on Wonderworld, there was this new trend towards these kids quiz shows, as you say, and that was a big thing in the 90s. You know, James Sherry, James was hosting a bunch of these these shows as, as well. And it was actually, once I had that foot in the door from back in 1986 on Saturday Jukebox, it, it was much easier after that because producers would would come and talk or they'd say, hey, we've got this or we've got that or you audition. Often you still had to audition for these things. You didn't just get it. But uh, some of the producers of those kids' quiz shows originally, My Generation, on actually that was Channel Nine. Uh, they when I was working there on Wonderworld, they came to me and said, "Look, we've got this this new show. Would you like to to audition and have a go?" And it it went really well. And once I started doing that, then I had Southern Star Television uh, knocking on the door saying, "Hey, we've got a, a new kids quiz show called Time Masters happening back at Channel Seven. So I went to do that. It, it was quite a bit different because it was going from the outdoors. Wonderworld was that magazine format and back to the indoors, back to being a studio-based show. And one of the reasons those programs were successful was was a financial reason. They were able to record five of these shows in one day, whereas with Wonderworld, for example, it would take us a whole week to make enough stories for one show. So there was a financial reason for these kids' quiz shows. I mean, they were fun and entertaining, hopefully. (laughs) Oh, they they were. And uh, (laughs) as being a teenager at the time, don't want to show the whole age thing sorry about that <laughs> but they did look like they were a lot of fun especially with um wipeout i was so keen to get onto that show but i yeah, didn't get there sure. i was stuck in sydney ah uh, never mind see we a lot of these uh were, were recorded in in brisbane brisbane was v- very active for children's television production at that time you had wombat you had agro you had totally wild you had all these kids quiz shows you had uh, cartoon connection with teresa livingston and Anne marie bigger you had all of the boris's breakfast club all these shows were coming out of brisbane so sydney specialized in let's say the the lifestyle magazine news melbourne specialized in the drama and the comedy uh and there was other things going on in adelaide i think humphrey was being made in in adelaide 
ahead. Perth, Perth was doing a bit as well. We recorded one of these kids' quiz shows over there at one point. But Brisbane was very much the heart and the hub of children's television production in Australia at that time. So we're talking mid-80s through until the mid, mid-90s mid or, or so. And then that all, sadly, in my opinion, but that, that all changed because of uh, aggregation of television networks and the centralisation. There's a couple of big words for you. Gosh, you never thought a kid show host would be capable of that. <laughs> they were then centralising some of these programs back to Sydney and, and, and back to Melbourne. And it sort of all changed from there. We then went into more of these reality formats that came in from America and, you know, and, and here we are today. But uh, Brisbane was a, a very active uh, production base for a lot of these programs at, at that time. So we would do five in in one day. And uh, I mean, it was the, the, they were mad. Those days were mad. If you can imagine being in a studio full of two or 300 screaming kids <laughs> and doing five shows, I got to, I'd get to the end of that day and I, I would have a headache uh, because they were fast paced programs. You had to really think on your feet because you'd get to the fifth show, which was the Friday edition. And often that was the big show, which would determine the winning school for the week. And just when physically and mentally you were flagged, and you, you're quite fatigued, you had to actually dig deep and, and, you know, you had to step up and really deliver and, and still try and be entertaining, still try and be mildly funny where it was relevant or appropriate and, and still uh, deliver. So they, they, were, they were solid days. And, you know, some of the memories from Time Masters, for example, actually, I was only talking to, to my partner, Veronique, about this the other day. We, you know, I can laugh about it now, but uh, and I haven't spoken about this, Matt, virtually to anyone. Oh, hello. Over Exclusive. Years, but here we go. <laughs> here we go. Exclusive. <laughs> Breaking news. <laughs> this, and this isn't fake news, Matt, or, or alternative news. This is, <laughs> this is real. But, uh, you know, and at the time we weren't allowed to talk about it. But I remember once uh, a girl got stuck in the tunnel. We had this tunnel on Time Masters at the top of the the, the the set and it would spin around and the kids had to climb through this obstacle course then into the tunnel then get to the top and press the buttons to answer the questions and she got the poor thing well I, I think I can tell you this too we used to stick a bit of talcum powder in the tunnel so it was a bit slippery <laughs> <laughs> gosh I'm letting you in on all the secrets here wow <laughs> if, talk about a challenge only, <laughs> no and the regulators would have been right onto us <laughs> and you know just a little bit of talcum powder just to make it a little bit slipperier and you know, make it perhaps more visually appealing for the cameras. You're just making it smell a bit better. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I think the host might have needed some of that too, just quite <laughs> out to five episodes. But, uh, you know, and, and I could see all of this going on. So I'm there commentating and I'm, you know, trying to to get through the segment and I can see the poor thing because we had a camera in the tunnel and I could see the poor thing was stuck. And then I was trying to get the attention of the floor manager saying, hey, she's stuck. And then she was in there for a bit too long. We got to the end of the segment. She came down. I was there throwing to the commercial break and I could just see her face face go pale. Oh, no. <laughs> and I could, I could see that it wasn't going to end well. Oh. So uh, we went to the commercial break and then we had a bit of cleaning up to do during the commercial break is all I'll say. But, you know, I mean, I can, I can look back now and, and laugh, but uh, wow. very fond memories of, of those times. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> imagine cleaning that up and it's like, no, nothing to see here. Meanwhile, there's a cloud of talcum powder <laughs> floating around. Yeah, that's right. So lots of those, you know, lots of those little little uh, sort of sort of stories. And actually, what what's kind of interesting now is, you know, that just seems like uh, such a long time ago. And occasionally, I'll get someone who'll reach out on Twitter or Facebook, or they'll, you know, get in touch somehow, and they'll say, "I had one from a bloke the other day. He said, Tony, it's Cola. I was a contestant. I was with uh, Logan, you know, Springwood State School or something like that, and I was a, I was a contestant. Do you remember me?" And I'm thinking. Gosh, we had thousands of those contestants. But, you know, it's nice when people get in touch and he's saying, oh, I've been to uni and I'm doing this now. And, you know, occasionally do people do reach out and get in touch. And, and they're now adults, which is at the time they would have been 12-year-olds or 13-year-olds. And now they've grown up and got jobs and careers and got their own their own families. And for them to – for that to have been such a significant part of their, their childhood, they – the race home from school, they'd turn on the telly at four o'clock in the afternoon and let's play wipeout. You know, there, there it was. And that's kind of, that's kind of special to have been 
a part of their lives in, in some small way. Well, bless YouTube because um, people, when they dust off their VHS tapes and everything else or doing a big clean out, they go, oh, what's this? And then they'll find the episode that they were on or a two-hour block session that they recorded yeah. and they go, you know what, I'll put that online. And on next YouTube. Thing, yeah, 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 and that, that's one thing which I love about YouTube is that, um, and I've actually spoken to Jamie Dunn about this uh, when I briefly worked with him, was yes. that um, when I spoke to him about the agro's uh, bloopers that are on YouTube, he goes, oh, yeah, I'm aware of that. My kids pointed it out to me, but he doesn't have any of the tapes uh, and he kind of regrets that he doesn't have them but there was no point because there was always uh, you know a few short segments and then in between yeah. you got the cartoons but it's all the extra parts where um, he wish he kept because every now and then he likes to hop on YouTube and reflect on it and realise they mm. were good times or um, the parts that actually go to air they he would say oh no there was something else that happened um that was like the third take or because, yeah. you know, someone would be swearing or there would be a kid who vomited in the studio. Or, <laughs> yeah. Kid got stuck in the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, that was when the talcum powder cloud died out. Yeah. So yeah, it was just right. all those little bits which, um, yeah. and unfortunately I can see that, you know, the major networks wouldn't really release any of the kids' children shows, but I know no. that... Um, Nickelodeon have got the American version of Double Dare on iTunes, but you'll never see the Australian version, um, which yeah, was Larry very Andrew. true. Yeah, or such as yours, you know, Time Masters or uh, Wipeout or, you know, James Sherry is amazing or, you know, they're yeah. all there and it, it's they need to release that stuff because now and it's, un, you know, 20 odd years later or whatever time length it is, people um, such as myself would easily hop online and grab it and go, you know, here's uh, two ninety nine. bam, I'll get the episode. So I remember watching that and it's that nice reflection back in the day. Yeah. yeah. I, I just wish I was getting a royalty for, for some of that sort of stuff. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what happens these days? Whenever I whenever I need an, an old tape or something like that, I just give mum and dad a call because they've got them all <laughs> filed away there, all the old VHS tapes. And, and I tell you who is great for that. Uh, sadly, I didn't keep much either. Uh, but Laurel Edwards, Laurel, if, if if you're ever looking for something, just give Laurel a call. I'm like, Laurel, would you have that episode from OK from uh, the Christmas edition from 1989? Oh, yeah, Tone. Yep, yep. No, I've got that. That's nice. <laughs> she was great for that. But see, the, the thing is I've been back through occasionally through some of the old tapes and these days you're struggling or you're lucky to find a VHS player to actually do it. Or Betamax. Remember Betamax? Oh, yeah. Some <laughs> of these are on Betamax. <laughs> We're still trying to forget. Yeah, Betamax, but um, uh, you go to play them and sadly sometimes the tape is deteriorated or it's destroyed or it's it's got dust all over it or whatever. I've had a few where I've done that trying to put together a bit of a compile or I don't know, maybe even pop them pop them on, on online or on YouTube, as you say. And and sadly now the tape is destroyed or deteriorated. So so you're right, it is I guess it, it pop culture and what we're talking about here, as you say, you might be able to find the American version, but this is also a big part of Australia during these periods of time, during the you know, the the, the youth uh, and growing up through the seventies, the eighties, the the, the 90s, this was a big part of the lives for, for you know, some people and some families uh, growing up at that time. And I had heard recently, and I won't say who or which network, but I had heard recently that I worked with all of the networks and one of the places where I worked, uh, their li- they had basically um, tossed out their library of, of programs and of footage. Now, this was losing 30 or 40 years of these programs That's tragic. that were basically... It is. And, and when I heard that, I cringed. I almost cried. And I thought, my God, this, this is actually, you know, these are historical records. We might not look at it like that always, but I think as, fur- as we get further into the future, we reflect and say, well, that was a part of Australian life and culture at that time. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, my goodness, you can't, you can never get that back. You can never replicate that. And these archives, they, they do need to be preserved and they should be uh, preserved. And that's, you know, that's why I was really happy you got in touch and that you're talking about these sorts of things because it does keep some of those memories alive. Well, um, and this is where my nerdiness comes in. Uh, Speaking of that stuff, uh, archiving and everything else, um, and as daggy as it sounds uh, with 
say Daryl Summers, right? He has been digitising all his Hey Hey It's Saturday episodes and putting them online oh, through the Hey Hey dot TV site, paying in yeah. charging a subscription because uh, his production company owns the rights to it, and yes. because of that, he charges. I think it's roughly, and I'm probably the only person who's doing it, but I own a subscription to it. This is how I know all this stuff. You're, you're the you're the one. Yeah, exactly. the, I'm paying my six ninety five, and that gets him a Macca's meal a week. So he, <laughs> uh, yeah, he's been digitising everything. So um, and because a lot of the masters, they've. Uh, slowly deteriorating and at the moment he's gone back to at the time of this conversation um, he only just released an episode from 1980 but uh, they're not yeah. some of them aren't fully complete however he's been doing the archiving stuff um, to keep it preserved for future generations like th th there's a lot of stuff in that hey hey archive which has never been seen before or was only seen yeah. once and I think it was somewhere where I read um, not long ago um, and this is before your and my time um, do, you know do you have you heard of the Mavis Bramston show yeah 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 I, I worked with a producer who who uh, Rod Kirk who worked on uh, the Mavis Bramston show so yeah it's, I, I know of it yeah well I do remember reading somewhere that um, Carol Ray, who was Ma Mavis Bramston, um, well, she, she, I think she's still alive, um, that she wanted episodes of Mavis Bramston released on DVD because she wanted to do commentary. And she is into, I'd say, her mid-90s now. And Brilliant. Yeah, she wants that preserved because it was the time of her life. She wants to reflect on yeah. it. And she uh, wanted to record a commentary before she starts losing all her memories mm. from it and mm. I think mm. it was Channel 7 who owns the rights or owns copies or something like that they don't want to release it so yeah. you, you, we're losing stuff like that um, because either it's going to cost too much but no matter what happens, it's people can easily digitise it. It's they just mm -hmm. don't want to put the time and effort into it. Yeah, I guess rights and royalties have have always been an issue, and and cop copyright and who owns what. And back then we didn't have those platforms and those opportun digital opportunities to to share. I can certainly understand that if someone owns something that once it's out there online, they can potentially lose control of that. But there's there's got to be a way, and there has to be a better way. And and thankfully, Matt. Do you you know what it is. I mean, it, yeah, it's the networks that have kept things and production companies and whatever, and people like uh, Laurel Edwards and Daryl Summers. And actually, I was reading even here in Switzerland. I, I stay in touch with the Aussie News uh, quite quite closely, and I was reading about Daryl and and what he was doing with digitising programs. And I thought, good on him. And 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 I think that was very. They were very astute business people as as well. Daryl and his his business partners in that they, the production company owned the program and the rights to the program and they still do so they were very astute in in that regard and rights and royalties have always been a a tricky area yeah, but what has preserved a lot of this material that we're talking about are, are people who worked on those programs and viewers who who made copies and had them in their own in their own libraries or just sort of sitting around under the TV gathering dust or on top of the the VCR. And thankfully now, you know they, you know they have put a few. And and I, you know, I, I have to have to admit I have done a bit of a search on YouTube and look for some of the old, only out of interest or when I have friends and I have uh, nephews and others saying, oh, you know. Uncle Anthony, as they call me, can you, can you show us some of the old stuff? And I don't have them much to show them. So we jump on YouTube and we have a bit of a look around. And you know what happens, Matt? <laughs> yeah. I cringe. <laughs> <laughs> I sit there and I put my hand in front of my face and I go, oh, my God, look at my hair. Oh, my God, what was I wearing? Oh, dear. It's not always easy looking back at that stuff. You know, when I came across the Wonderworld theme uh, during my research and yeah. when I played it, I've got, oh, this is fantastic hit play, yeah. put it on the full screen and the, yeah. some of the people who I work with uh, are, are actually quite younger than me and they were probably about three or four when it was on TV so they weren't aware of it. They're going, what's this? Yeah. And I went, oh, it's what's Wonder Woman. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I said, don't, don't worry, you don't know, you're, you're seeing this one now, you haven't seen Tom and, oh, Simon Townsend's Wonder World, which goes yeah, back yeah, even the, further. the one before, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And I, t I tell you who you need to talk to too, who's... Uh, he was, and I'm I'm still in touch with this guy. He was one of the reporters on the original 
Wonderworld, Simon Townsend's Wonderworld, is Brett Clements. Now, Brett Clements was one of the reporters. Brett and Philip Tanner had big success with the Nightmare board video oh, board games. Yes. Remember those? Yes, I and do. They were like an interactive video and DVD that you'd play along with. I mean, they, they, these were smash hits around the world. Hmm. And Brett's on the Gold Coast these days with a very successful production company. And you need to talk to Brett. You also need to talk to Harvey Shaw, who was the producer of the original Wonder World, Simon Townsend, and also the Wonder World that I worked on. You know, all these people out there. And, and a lot of them are still connected with the industry in some way and using, and, and I know this is the case for me with what I'm doing now, daily, every single day with the work I'm doing now, making videos and producing videos for international companies here in Switzerland, I use and apply skills that I learnt from these kid shows, that I learnt from travelling the world with the great outdoors, that I learnt from working in radio. And people here say, oh, I don't know what it is, but your videos, there's a sunshine, there's a liveliness, there's a spirit in the videos that you make for us. So I create content for Nespresso and, and Nestle and, and other companies and they say, oh, there's just something in them, there's a spark. And you, and it's, it's the magic of what we learnt doing our apprenticeships, working on these kid shows back in the 80s and, and 90s. And, and still to this day, every single shoot that I do, I'm like, oh, yeah, we'll try this shot or try this trick or we'll do that because that's what we used to do on the kid shows and it worked and it still works today. So I'm very thankful for all of those experiences and how they carry through to the current time, the modern time, creating content in a digital world. And people like Brett Clements and Philip Tanner still in the industry and Harvey Shaw and Laurel Edwards. And I mean, you name them, there's hundreds of people that were working in Australian television through these periods who are still connected with the industry in some way and applying some of these, some of that experience to, to what they're doing. Yeah, it's always a growing development. No matter how far you think you've come, you can go even further uh, because a lot of people um, would generally think, oh, what happened to that person who's just disappeared or he or she, such as talking to yourself. Um, once I started researching, going, oh, where is he now? I knew you were successful elsewhere. I just didn't know what. And then as soon as it came up with, you radio Switzerland and all that. I go, wow, he's even yeah. had a huge, even bigger <laughs> career. Uh, and a lot of people do that because, yeah. sure, they will be in front yeah. of the camera um, and then they suddenly disappear. Um, I think another one, uh, sorry to go a totally different direction. but No, you go for it. I'm, I'm actually really enjoying listening <laughs> to your thoughts as, as well, Matt. This is just as interesting for me. Uh, Kim Kilby is another one and Eden Gahar. Uh, and the only reason why I'm... I'm mentioning these names is because I had a conversation recently with a friend of mine who's an even uber nerd and loves this stuff too. He's just too uh, microphone shy to uh, actually get into this. And um, they've, uh, Kim Kilby, who at one stage hosted Australia's Funniest Time Videos. Funniest Time Videos. Yep. Yeah. Um, and she's a producer um, for um, somewhere in Hollywood, as well as Eden Gahar, where he's having a major success uh, behind the camera and uh, Jason Stevens is another one who was part of the late show Degeneration where he kind of yeah. disappeared after that show finished but he didn't because he ended up producing high quality TV that everyone's seen like the Choir of Hard Knocks and that Graham Kennedy TV uh, telly movie mm -hmm. thing The King and um, and so forth so and he ended up mm -hmm. being uh, the one of the big bosses for Fremantle I think it was yes uh, don't quote me on yeah, the Fremantle but it was one of those production companies you're right I, I, I knew Eden from from that um, time and I'd heard that he he went on to New York at one period and I think was working with with MTV had a successful career I didn't know what Kim Kilby was up to so thank you for for that oh, one you're welcome a couple of others there was a guy you might recall. Now, this is going to jog your memory a bit. Mark Buhai. Mark was on Saturday Disney with Sophie Formica. Oh, wow. And, and Janine Mapp. And, I'm, oh gosh, I'm jogging my own memory here. But uh, Mark Buhai uh, was, was a presenter on Saturday Disney. Mark also did one or two of these kids' quiz shows in the 90s. Mark went on to a successful career as a television executive and working with one of the big American networks. And he was working between Asia and also the United States. Mark was one, another guy who I'm still in touch with. 
and some of these people were behind the scenes. Matthew Peterson was one of the cameramen on Time Masters and on Wipeout. Matt now has a very successful career in New York as a as a videographer, filmmaker, filming big commercials and as a photographer, highly talented guy, still in touch with Matt and he's over there doing his thing. And, you know, the, these are just a few, and people often rate and speak very highly of the Australian film and television production teams, the behind the scenes production crews. And it's it's the skills they have, it's the energy and enthusiasm with they, which they approach their work. And it's the experience. And I think part of it is that we, at a certain time in our in history and our careers, we, we had to do everything, as I was saying before, and same with a lot of these crews. So we're often quite inventive. We find solutions. We're very practical. We, you know, something, we, 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 we've got skills and techniques we can uh, incorporate or utilize to actually enhance a production or enhance a, a shoot just because when you first started out you had to do a bit of everything you had to do a bit of lighting and you had to do a bit of camera assisting and you had to do a bit of sound so when you get to a certain point or a stage in your career you can apply all, all of this and it's highly regarded around the world US uh, United Kingdom Europe uh, elsewhere people often speak very highly of the Aussie crews they always say we we play and party a bit hard after hours <laughs> at the rap at the rap parties but uh and that's why you should always be a multitasker no matter what position you are because if that main position that you're in suddenly dissolves uh for whatever reason you can go oh i'm actually good at that and um then you never know that other path in that industry could yeah. um bloom even further and next thing you know you you know, you end up being an even bigger shot than you already are. Yeah, it's a great it's a great point that you make, and it's a it's a good fallback. And my dad used to so dad was a newspaper printer, and so my family had a background in in advertising and and in that sort of print world. And dad used to say to me, you know, when I was first starting out on Saturday jukebox, he used to say, just make sure you've got something else under your belt. So I actually went to uni for for a period of time at QUT, Queensland University of Technology, as it was called now, uh, QIT. So sorry, Queensland Institute of Technology back then and did communications. And so at a point where, you know, I had a period of time in television. So it's now been over 30 years in media. And then I went into radio for a while, which I absolutely loved for, for different reasons, which we can chat about. And beyond that, now here in, here in Switzerland, producing and creating content using all of these skills, it's almost like it's been a, a resurgence or a, or a second career, um, you know, but still still involved in media, still using all of those skills. Not I'm not often on camera or in front of camera these days. I still host programs and moderate things over here, but uh, I've had a, let's say, a, a, a second career in media using all of these skills from that from that earlier time. That's why it pays off to read the credits on every single part of a TV <laughs> show or a movie or anywhere on a website because you never know where one person's going to pop up. Oh, it's funny. I went to the movie we went to the movies the other night and to this day, it's funny you say that, I still sit there at the end of the movies and TV shows, although they don't play the credits as much anymore. They put all those sponsors ads on better the movies when they play the credits. I still to this day sit there right through until the end of end of the credits and I, I, don't, I don't know why I think it's just you know it's it's in the blood yeah don't blame you at all <laughs> you're mentioning your radio career now um, you've had an extensive uh, radio career um, even though you're having it now but when you started uh it was back in the eighties, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Uh, well, it was. It was kind of interesting uh, when I very first started out. A, a good friend of mine was hosting the breakfast show at FM one hundred and four, as it was called back then in in Brisbane. FM one hundred and four Triple M, and it was uh, Bill Healy and Rod Tiley, Mister T, who's uh, only recently passed away. And Bill was a, a family friend, and I used to go in and I would watch them doing their show, and I used to love it. And there was just that certain fascination with with radio and radio programs. 
Then in the 90s, I co-hosted the night show at K-Rock. Uh, what was it? 92.5 on the Gold Coast? So oh, once again, jogging the memory here, Matt. K-Rock FM. There was CFM and there was K-Rock FM on, on the Gold Coast. And I did the night show with Dave Andrews. Now, Dave is doing the traffic reports in Brisbane. These Chopper days. Dave. That Chopper Dave, that's it. Yep. <laughs> and we're, we're connected on, on social media as well. And I had gone down to do an interview with Dave based on what I was doing in TV and, and it went really well. And uh, the program director, Ray, 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 can't remember his surname, but Ray got rang up and said, oh, look, do you want to do the night show with Dave? So I did that for, a, I think it was about a year or so. Got a bit of a taste for radio. Didn't then do much uh, because, you know, I was keeping pretty busy in TV. And then in the early uh, 2000s, I, I got into, I was working at Channel 7 doing the weather for 7 News and doing the Great Southeast, which was a local sort of travel lifestyle program. And 4BC, Talkback Radio Station in Brisbane, got in touch and said, oh, look, you know, would you be interested in, in doing the night show? So I did the night show at 4BC for about a year. And th- it then progressed to uh, to the ABC. Um, I, I filled in actually when Spencer the house and used to be away on the breakfast show when he was on holidays. I'd fill in for Spencer. He used to love it. And I know you've got a love for radio too, Matt. And I think what it is for me, it's it's connecting. I love connecting with people regardless of, of, of the way in which you connect. I just love hearing and learning about other people's lives and hearing their stories and how we have the potential for insight and personal development and the benefit or for the betterment of society to learn from from these people and their experiences. So that's a big driver or a, a big motivation for me with the industry. And, and with radio, you don't have the benefit of pictures to help you tell that story as you do in, in television. So you've really got to rely on the, the voice, the ability or the capacity to tell the story and paint a mental picture. And that's one of the things I love about it, along with when I was a kid growing up, my grandparents had a, a farm on the mid-north coast of New South Wales and I'd go to the farm and it was back then it felt quite isolated you know the mailman came once a week and Nan would listen to John Laws hello world this is John Laws golden (laughs) tonsils that's right and still do you know still applying his craft to, to this day and I'd listen I'd you know Nan would have that on in the background each morning and I'd be there in the background doing my thing being a kid and I'd develop and then listening to the cricket with dad on the ABC uh, you know during the Australian summers. And so I think it was a, that was also a part of the influence on my interest in, in radio. And then having worked in media and then starting to work in radio, I actually felt it was a, a, a real honour to be able to um, connect with people and to hear about their lives and learn more about their lives through that through that medium. And worked at the ABC for, for a period of time, both in Brisbane and also at uh, the Lismore Studios when I was living in northern New South Wales in Byron Bay. I worked out there doing the, the morning show and on the Gold Coast where I did the breakfast show at uh, ABC Coast FM. I was there for, for a few years on and off and then came to Switzerland to work with the national broadcaster here. And TV is my first love and I think it's because that's what I started doing. But I have this this huge passion for radio that still exists to this day. And so these days, part of what I'm doing in addition to producing and creating videos and content for international companies and organisations based in Switzerland, I'm also producing a number of, of podcasts. So doing what you're doing, but I'm doing that on a, a corporate level or a corporate scale. So you might be talking to an employee of a particular company about who they are, where they're from, what they do, and learning more about their life to share with other employees within that company. Now, some of these companies have tens of thousands of employees and uh, to learn more about the lives of other employees who are in offices around the world, this has been really beneficial for them. So these mediums, something like radio, something like podcasting, once again, helps to bring to light the stories that would otherwise not be told and that would otherwise... Be, be lost somewhere within the organisation. So still very much uh, enjoying that, that side of what I do. That's a very different level of content right there. When you're getting yeah, close to the staff members of the yeah. major corporations, because it, yeah. it, at least it, it's another way for management or anyone higher up uh, to go, oh, okay, I didn't realise that. And 
or yes. you know w- whatever way uh, it's another way to get constructive feedback I guess a- absolutely and it's it's a form of engagement it's a form of of collaboration it's that shared knowledge and shared learning so someone in some part of the world so you know I might be talking to an employee of a company in Russia in 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 the Philippines elsewhere and you're getting their insights from what they do solutions to problems uh, but you're also you know it's it's getting a bit of that human quality that that authentic quality into some of these these large often impersonal uh, corporations so it's personalizing it and bring it to life and saying hey we're actually we're actually people here and we're people working together and we can work together more effectively if we understand what other people are doing and that they are people they're not just someone on the end of a of an email where often it can be very impersonal they're actually people with lives uh, with background with experiences who've got something to say and something to to share it's been quite liberating and the response i've had from different companies here has been very strong and very positive because they're saying we didn't know about that person or we didn't know that person existed or we didn't know, uh, you know, something about what they what they do that they now know. And so they've, they've been very complimentary about what that's added to their corporate and internal uh, communications. And it's still, it's a variation on a, on, a, on a thought or a theme. It's once again, it's using all these skills and all of this experience from 80s kids TV in Australia. Well, there you go. You've got to <laughs> no, start that, somewhere. That's it. You've got to start someplace. <laughs> it can only go downhill from there. No, no, no. It's a wonderful, wonderful grounding. And I hope to be doing that uh, until I can't do it any, any longer. And at this point in my life and in my career, I'm, I'm looking towards, uh, I'm getting closer now, would you believe, Matt, to retirement than what I am back to these kids shows. You know, I'm, I'm close to 50 now. And so you start to think about 60, 65, 70 and, and retirement and what I'll be doing. And one of the things I'd like to be doing is still using some of these skills and perhaps connecting with uh, elements of society where they have a voice that's not being heard. So some form of or some underprivileged uh, or oppressed situation or oppressed culture and to be uh, helping to to voice uh, some of those thoughts and some of those concerns and some of those some of those stories so that's that's what I'm thinking towards for for the future you might as well give yourself a plug what's the company that you control at the moment I'm the chief cook and bottle washer <laughs> and I'll make a and I make a good cover. So I'm, I'm independent. I'm, I'm freelance. I have my own small situation. So I offer a very hands-on sort of boutique service here in here in Switzerland for production. And it's basically Tony Johnston or Tony Johnston Media. Uh, the website is TonyJohnston.tv. But don't take a look because it needs desperately needs updating. You know, you know the story, Matt, in the situation where you spend more time helping other people and making their content look good, and not spending enough time on your own. So it desperately needs updating but you know on LinkedIn on Twitter uh, on all of the social media networks so if anyone listening has enjoyed our conversation wants to get in touch or reach out and just say good day or I'd love you know I'd love to, to say hi so Tony Johnston TV LinkedIn or, or Twitter at Johnston Tony at Johnston Tony on on Twitter as well Matt there you go so if anyone who was a contestant when they were younger on any of your shows <laughs> hey you remember me feel free to send him a That's message right. on Twitter <laughs> The, the little girl who got stuck in the tunnel, <laughs> if you'd like to, I, I, I don't want any lawsuits, but if you want to get in touch and uh, and say, hello, I've got a, a few more of those sorts of stories up my sleeve, Matt, but that might be for, for another time for part two of the, uh, the Tony Johnston story. I am so looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Tony, uh, for sharing, opening up and, and just answering and filling in all those gaps, <laughs> really, that for well, I, for myself... Um, have been curious on but hopefully for everyone else who's actually listening right now hopefully that's answered a couple of questions but thank you so much Tony I really appreciate the time you've taken to have a chat thoroughly enjoyed it Matt and I've also really enjoyed the step back in time and keep up the great work with what you're doing too well that wraps up this edition of the Nostalgia Podcast thank you again so much Tony 
it had been a little while since we were trying to actually chat because it had been a game of tag. When he was available, I wasn't. And when I was available, he wasn't. But we eventually worked it out. And this episode is the result of it. Anyway, thank you for downloading and listening to this podcast. I uh, really appreciate it. Feel free to send me some feedback. If you shoot me an email, ozstalgia at gmail.com or check the account out on Twitter and on Facebook. Feel free to give us a bit of a like. But make sure you stay subscribed to the podcast because there'll be more interviews down the track. We've got a few lined up. And make sure you visit nostalgia.com. Appreciate it. Anyway, I'll see you in the next podcast. Ciao.